Talk of the Gaza. This is Will Sanchez. Thank you for tuning in. This is a very special episode of Gotta Run. We are opening up my 12th year at Manhattan Neighborhood Network, producing and hosting Gotta Run. It is also my 300th episode. All but two were recorded here at Manhattan Neighborhood Network or at Manhattan Neighborhood Network at the Firehouse. There are a few people I need to thank. First and foremost, Manhattan Neighborhood Network for training us, for supporting us, and for making this a very, very safe environment to produce our shows. In addition, my directors, Susan Finelli and Gloria Messa. Unfortunately, they cannot be here today because of the pandemic. I'm honored. My special guest for my 300th episode is Dr. Faith Davies. She is a recreational runner, but she is a nationally renowned doctor in blood diseases in hematology. She is a director at the Milona Clinic at NYU Perlmutter Cancer Center. For disclosure, I was diagnosed with smoldering myeloma last year, and I am a patient at Perlmutter Cancer Center. I want to talk all about this disease. I'm honored to have Dr. Faith Davies as my guest. Welcome. Thank you so much, Will, and thank you for having me on the 300th edition. That's amazing. But thank you so much. On the way over, I was thinking about my first episode, and it was also with a doctor, Dr. Dan Hamder. How could I forget that name? And he was a pioneer in his field. He started late to become a doctor. He wasn't going to make it as an actor in Hollywood, so he went to the <laughs> medical field. And he, interestingly, he was one of the first sports doctors back in his day. There wasn't that much where runners could go in order to get help for their overuse injuries. And so one of the things runners say, one of our mantras is always listen to your body. Yep. And, and coming to this disease, this myeloma disease, I've heard through the, uh, in my research, that blood is the body's truth. It's, a, it's, it's an own form of listening to your body. But sometimes you don't understand what your body is telling you. So the second part of listening to your body, and if you don't understand what it's telling you, because your body never lies to you, check in with your coach. Yeah. And in this case, check in with your doctor. So doctor, tell us, what is this myeloma disease? I think just to go back what you said, that is so true. If something's not quite right, check in. And you're completely correct. So myeloma is a kind of blood cancer. There's probably about 35,000 new cases in the US each year. So it's relatively rare. But it's a blood cancer that's unusual and presents with very unusual symptoms. So sometimes people can be tired because their hemoglobin levels low and they're essentially running on half a tank of gas. Sometimes they can have back pain or bone pain. And sometimes they can have problems with their kidneys or frequent infections. And so it's a slightly different cancer to say maybe breast cancer or bowel cancer because it presents with these unusual symptoms. So it's sometimes difficult to put your, your finger on exactly what's going wrong. But usually patients will say they've been to their doctor a few times complaining about their back and just can't get to the bottom of it. And then their doctor does some blood tests and hey, presto, they come out with this blood cancer. Okay, that's M spike in my case. That's the one. So every year I go to see my doctor for my annual. And of course they do the, what do they call it, the complete yeah. comprehensive blood count. That's the one. And something unusual came up. It was a protein that's not supposed to be there, and you do the follow-up. Well, there are three stages. There's MGUS. So tell us of those three stages, MGUS, smoldering, and active. That's right. So we've got these three stages, and the MGUS one is actually relatively common. And as you say, it tends to be for people who go either for their regular checkup or go to the doctor for something else. And those patients, or should I say individuals, because they're not really a patient, 
they have a small protein in their blood, but theoretically it doesn't do any damage. So that's one group. We then have the group on the other side where those patients, the small protein is doing a damage either to the bone or to the kidneys or to the blood. And those patients need to have some treatment, whereas the patients with just a little protein don't need some treatment. Then there's this group in the middle that we call smoldering myeloma, where we're a little bit concerned in that the patient is okay at the moment, the levels are all right, but we're just a bit worried that it might go on and develop and cause some issues and problems. And so that group of patients we tend to follow very, very closely because not everybody will go on and get problems. And if a patient is going to go on and get problems, we want to be there and sort it out quickly. Okay. You joined a Weight Watchers group. Weight yeah. meaning WAIT is active monitoring. Yeah. And those people that are considered standard risk. Yeah. There are some you know from past experience that geez, within two years, you're probably going to transition to this active. We want to do treatment, even though you don't have the disease per se, you don't have the cancer. We want to start treatment. Yeah, that's right. In the old days, we didn't have such good drugs. And so actually we would wait until those patients got a problem with their bone or had a fracture or had a problem with their kidneys. But now our drugs are so much better. Um, they're not without side effects, but they certainly have less side effects. And so actually now, as you say, there's this group of patients where we say, right, okay, we know you don't have what we call end organ damage, but we know it's going to come in the next few months. Let's get in there and let's do the treatment before you have that problem. Okay. And then there's this other group where we're thinking, well, actually, maybe their disease is not going to cause them a problem for three years or five years or maybe never. And so that group of patients, we're going to do the watchful waiting. And that always sounds easy from the outside, but actually sometimes that can be more problematic because I think from a patient's perspective, it feels as if you're just sitting there watching and waiting for something to go wrong. Right, right, right. I joined a few support groups. And not too surprising that uh, when they go for those tests, because that watchful waiting means you've been tested every three months, sometimes six months, but usually it's every three months, which is four times a year. And during that testing time, people are nervous. What's going to show? Is it going to show... Uh, and they use interesting terms. I mean, this this world of uh, myeloma or blood cancers is totally fascinating. And myeloma is, is very, very complicated. And so the concern is my myeloma awakening. There's this term meaning, oh, your numbers are going up. Uh, I think primarily your M spike is going up. Um, but, 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 you know, I was luckily, because I had a few months to, to think about it and review this, because at first I was in total panic, I went to Dr. Google, and that was a big mistake. And in the sense that there's lots of misinformation or lots of scary information, and there's good information. And eventually I found Health3, which is one of the good sites. But thinking about it, you know, I'm thinking, wait a minute, you know, there's something why is it called myeloma, for example? What does the term mean? And yeah. where does it occur? Is it, what part of the body is myeloma? Okay, really good questions. So it's called multiple myeloma, okay? And that's because um, it can occur in multiple places. Now, when we think about many other cancers, let's say breast cancer or lung cancer, we actually worry when it occurs in multiple places. But with myeloma, we expect it to occur in multiple places. So we don't worry so much. And so nowadays, most of the time, we drop the multiple word and just use the myeloma word. And it occurs as, so it's a problem with one of the blood cells, one of the blood cells that fights infections. And the blood cells are made in the bone marrow. And so that's usually in the big bones in the body. So the hips, the spine, the top of the legs, the top of the arms. So very much the bones of the body. And that's why when many pa patients present, they present with bony pain. Okay. 
one of the uh, health three lectures, which is very good because uh, they're short, they're under, well under five minutes. Some of the other lectures, especially by the professors and the researchers, uh, it goes on for hours or an hour and a half, two hours, and you're looking for the executive summary and explain exactly why vitamin D works or why this works and what the tests were. But these lectures, one of the doctors had a really nice analogy about the bone marrow. He said, your bone marrow has like 20% red blood cells, maybe 60% white blood cells, 10% of blood clotting, 10% of something else. And this is 1% plasma. And the plasma cells is where the myeloma occurs. Yeah. Some of the plasma cells misbehave. Yep. And then what happens is, correct me if I'm wrong, it, it, it starts reproducing uncontrollably. Yep. And so this garden of red, white, clotting, specialized plasma starts yeah. growing. Yeah. And, and, and so to a typical bone marrow only has 1%. Patients that have my, myeloma have 10%, 20%, 30%. Yeah. And higher. And higher. No, you're completely correct. The gardening analogy is actually a good one because essentially they're weeds that do that drown everything else out. And so the other cells can't live and don't grow very okay. well. And these guys grow. They grow. All right. Also in my research, the name Robert Kyle oh. comes up. And he's still alive. Oh, he is an amazing gentleman. Not only is he a font of knowledge, but he is the most adorable gentleman in the whole world. We do know that each and every one of you has had a monoclonal protein in your blood or in your urine prior to your development of multiple myeloma. He comes across extremely well on video. What was, what was fascinating, he's the one who came up with the word MGUS. But he did it in 1960. Mm -hmm. This one woman that kept coming back to the Mayo Clinic with various problems, and they measured her, and they, they didn't have any anything of what we have today. And they kept sending her home. Eventually, she came back, and the doctor saw her and and, and realized this, this 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 distinction he called MGUS. Um, but that, but that raised the question in my mind, well, wait a minute, 1960s? I mean, this disease has only been, been known about since the 1960s. What happened before 1960s? People who had this disease, I mean, I'm sure the disease just didn't pop, occur in the 1960s or 50s. So what happened in the in prior yeah. 1950s? So they did know about it prior to that. Actually, in the history books, there was um, a lady, and I can't remember her name, Sarah something, that was diagnosed in London. Um, and um, Dr. Kyle actually shows an amazing picture of this. Um, and um, she had lots of bony problems and they actually treated her with rhubarb. So there we go. Um, and um, there was a, another doctor in London as well called Dr. Bence Jones. And he, he recognized that some patients have um, foamy urine, so they have um, bubbles in their urine, and that's because they often will have too much protein in their urine. So it has been known about for a long time. One of the reasons it maybe seems a little bit more common now than back then is it tends to be a disease of when you get a little bit older. So it's rare under the age of 40, and it is much more common when you get to be 70 or 80. And so I guess back in the 1900s, not that many people oh. lived to that age. Oh. And so it was slightly oh. um, slightly rare. That's interesting. Yeah, they, uh, one of the lectures says that 3%, well, one lecture said 3% over 70, and then one of the researchers, 3% over 50 have this MGUS. Yeah. So which is it, 3% over 70? Was... Yes, yeah. So as, as, you, as you get older, the percentage increases. So once you get to over 80, it's actually about 5%. Ah, so the myeloma occurs in the bone marrow. But when they do a bone marrow biopsy, they don't do it in the spine. They, they do it in the lower back near the pelvic bone. Yeah. Why is that the best place to do okay. it? Okay. 
So there's two places we can do it. We can either do it in the pelvic bone or in the sternum. And that's the main reason for that is, I guess, twofold. One, because they're sites we can easily get to, to, um, to do it. And the second is that in the adult, they're the most common sites that you still make your blood. In a small child, you make your blood in all sorts of bones, whereas in the adult, it's actually restricted where you make your blood. Oh, that's so interesting. You mentioned that anemia, or you said you know, low, yeah. low red blood cells, which, which can cause anemia. Have you ever seen uh, a Dalton Abbey? Yes. Is that one of your favorite shows? <laughs> yes. <laughs> a few years ago, I had some issues, and the doctor, after a while, said I had pernicious anemia. And he says, don't worry about it. All you need to do is to take vitamin B12 one at a time, or liquid B12, and that should take care of it. Yeah. Now, the reason I mentioned Dr. Abbey, my wife and I watch it religiously when it was on TV. Yeah. And one of the episodes, I think it was the last one of the season, the doctor in the episode was diagnosed with pregnacious anemia. I said, okay. And it scared me because in this episode, it was fatal. The doctor was going to die. They said there was nothing to do. He wasn't going to get married. He's going to marry Isabel, I think it was. And he was going to go away to a, you know, whatever and die. Hmm. Well, it was so depressing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, uh, because this is a family show, it turned out, oh, wait a minute. It was misdiagnosed or, or they, the point is back in 1920s, a disease like Anemia, pernicious anemia, in fact, the word pernicious means deadly, you know, harmful, very harmful. So that is, I think, very different from the anemia that you would come across when you have those blood cells being crowded out yeah. by the plasma cells. Yeah, that's right. It's a, a different kind of anemia. So some of our patients will have vitamin deficiencies and will often suggest that they take uh, extra vitamins. And indeed, some patients may have been misdiagnosed that their doctor thought they had anemia because of something else. And then it comes around to be um, anemia because of this crowding out. So um, just going back to what you were saying, one of the amazing things for me about, about myeloma is when I first started doing myeloma, which is like 25 years ago, the, the survival for patients then was incredibly low. It was one of the worst cancers we had. And the survival was maybe about three years or something like that. But nowadays we've had, it's probably the cancer with the most improvement in survival. And it's also the cancer with the most number of new drugs that have been approved for it in the space of kind of 10 to 15 years. And so such a huge amount of um, progress has been made. Getting, no, getting a cancer is never good. OK, however, I think that for myeloma, the, the outlook now is so, so much better. And it kind of circles back to something you were saying earlier about Dr. Google. That's one of the problems with Dr. Google and myeloma is that the data is often out of date because it's such a chain, quickly changing field and we've made such progress. In fact, uh, two things. One, with my research. I think every major hospital in the United States has a myeloma clinic. Yeah. Although it's considered an uncommon disease, it has a lot of resources up behind it. And it is always clinical trials going on. And in fact, that's where most of the, the new drugs are coming from. And if you have smoldering myeloma and you're not quite ready for the standard treatment, there are things called observational trials. In fact, in England, there's something called Cosmos. We aim to understand how some bone marrow cells develop into a cancer called myeloma. We now know that myeloma starts as a precancerous or precursor condition in the bone marrow called monoclonal gammopathy or MGUS or smoldering myeloma. In Cosmos, we want to understand why and who will develop myeloma so that we can develop new therapies to stop this from happening. And what I found fascinating is because they know if you've got a large enough group of people, approximately 50% of them will transition within five yeah. years. 
But is there a comparable study in the United States, the Cosmos? Yep. So there's a couple of studies actually in the United States. There's um, a large one being run out of Boston um, who, with the help of the um, NIH and the MMRF, which is looking at, um, it's called PROMISE, and it's looking at how patients, which patients may go on and um, develop um, myeloma. And then we actually have a study in NYU where we're actually looking at um, Caucasian patients who may go on to develop myeloma, but also African-American patients who may go on and develop myeloma. Because there's some recent data to suggest that African-American patients maybe have a three times more likely chance of developing myeloma than um, Caucasian patients. And so we're trying to look to see about the differences in that. And you know, when we go back to Dr. Kyle, I mean, he's, he's spent a lot of, of his career looking at this. One of the things that we can do now, though, is there's so many new genetic tests that are able to really get in deep and dirty into the genetic code and try and figure out why people are um, developing these diseases. But so there's the kind of genetic bit to it. But then also many of these studies have got um, quite lengthy questionnaires, but majority of the patients are very happy to help us fill in this, looking about their history, what they've done in the past, their exposures to chemicals, what kind of foods they eat, to really see if we can get down and figure out what exactly what kind of... Um, ah, excellent. Helps. So there's promise that's going on. This new one, what's it called? The, uh, the one SMART. I was just called SMART. SMART. Yes. Smoldering myeloma. <laughs> ah, SMART. Smoldering Smart. myeloma. I don't know. I think the Brit got the better name was Cosmos. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so Africans, Americans are two to three times. But I also read that men are more likely to get it than women. Yes. Yeah. And, and Caucasians are more likely than Asians. Yes. Yeah. But they don't really know why. No, that's right. And that's why you kind of come down to, is it something about the genes or is it something about the diet? Because, as you, you know, um, the Asian diet is very different right. to... to um, Asians are very go. fish oriented. Yeah. So, well, there have um, been studies with, with all sorts of cancers with diet. and the, the, the vegan diet is the best diet in terms of you know, you're 70 percent or 77 percent less likely to get cancer of any type on a vegan diet. But well, we'll talk about that with diet. But you said things about the genetics. So does myeloma run in families or could it run in families? The majority of people, it doesn't run in their family. There are a few families that we know about. And um, there's been some work looking at those families, trying to figure out why it may run in those families. There's two kind of big groups that are looking at that, one based in Utah and the other are actually based in Iceland. So there's a really amazing study group in Iceland doing the I-STOP MM study, which is looking at the whole population of Iceland. As you know, it's a, a relatively small country and maybe doesn't have the same immigration and emigration as other countries. And so they've got a genetic study going on there, trying to look to see if they can characterize, if it does occur in families, what might be doing that as well. Mm. These PROMISE studies and these SMART studies and these COSMOS studies would like to recruit some of those yes. that seems to run in family. Yeah, yeah. Well, in, in, in the old days, brothers and sisters would get married. And it's not as common nowadays, but first cousins could marry. And in some states, it's illegal to do that because of blood disorders. Could that be a possibility? Of, uh... It could be a possibility. One of the other things, though, as well, is that you also, although things have changed a little bit now, but families used to stay in the same environment as well and would be didn't tend to travel so much. So you always come back down to, is it genetics or is it environment? And we're, we're still not entirely, um, entirely okay. sure. Okay. But it sounds like we're in a path towards understanding that better through these trials and and it, although, or one of the challenges of some of these other studies, because it's relatively rare, is finding enough people to, to include in the study. So some things, you know, they only have seven or eight people, so it's hard to say, well, is this true for the general population? So these, these observational trials are very important. 
uh, and they and they go on for years, like like the the five six years. Why the length of time like that? Yeah, because particularly if we're looking at smoldering patients or MGUS patients, those early patients, some of them, yes, may go on to develop myeloma in a year or two, but some of them, their disease may stay quiet for twenty five years, and we really want need to compare those where it stays quiet for 25 years to those where it just stays quiet for a year, because those are the ones that are really going to tell us what's going, what's going on. And you're quite correct, because it's a rare disease, the, as one of the important things is the myeloma community, as in doctors and researchers, is actually quite a small community. And um, many patients are incredibly generous in the, the fact that they'll not only enter into a clinical study, but they'll also agree for the researchers to share their data between them. Now, obviously, that doesn't mean they share their name or any kind of details like that, but their data will then go anonymized into a bigger database so that, so that wider researchers can, can look at this because the more brains on it, the better. Yes, yes, I signed up for one of those. Uh, the Health Tree has a database. You can upload your, your numbers. And uh, of course, the hospitals like NYU, they are very sophisticated uh, uh, databases that, that you can, to a graph, pass results. And you get your blood test and you can compare it yeah. online. You don't have to keep a spreadsheet, you know, keep the numbers if you go to a major hospital that will, that will do it for you. And then these clinics, these like the, the health trade, they, if you give them permission, they'll upload that information or they'll have a database that they can compare. And they, and they offer services like you can find your twin, this other person that has the same makeup as you. And if you want to share results and stuff like that, you know, because uh, emotional support is a, it's a critical component of it. You know, and they have little little questionnaires that you should take to your doctor to ask questions when you first meet your, your myeloma specialist. Because once you are diagnosed, one of the recommendations is make sure you go to a myeloma specialist as part of the team. Because as you said, the, the, uh, the science changes monthly, if not daily. And it's really, really hard to keep up. So my primary doctor on the myeloma side is Dr. Gareth Morgan. And I had my sheet of paper, and he's, he's very personable. My wife came with me, and he said, do I have any questions? Yes, doctor. And that's so important. Many patients are, are worried about asking questions, but I was going to say I was chatting with your wife before, and there's a group called Patient Power, and their slogan is knowledge is power. And it's so true. If you want to take an active interest in your care, then doctors are very keen and willing to do that. And if they, if they don't like it, you need a new doctor. Well, Dr. Walker was interesting because, he, oh, he said he helped with some of these questions. Oh, you remember. And then, and then one of the questions I asked gave an interesting answer. It, 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 I had to think about it later on. One of the questions, you know, you know besides you know, what kind of myeloma is it? And it's just the cap in the lamp, that the free chains, da, 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 you know, it's like going into the weeds. But some of the questions were really very basic, like, you're going to be monitored every so often, but the question is, in between monitoring, why should you contact your doctor if you're feeling something is off? I asked Dr. Morgan that, and he said, don't worry about it. We're going to monitor you continuously. And, and he said he didn't think that was a great question to have. I said, well, I think one of the reasons is because I was talking, I was part of the community. Not everybody is close to a major hospital. They go to their local doctor who doesn't have nearly the experience as a Mayo Clinic or Dana Farber or NYU. And what they do is they partner up. And so when they see the local doctor, maybe the local doctor needs to know. Because I was thinking later, well, wait a minute. If he tells me, oh, if you have lower back pain, let, let me know. So well, he'll probably get a phone call every day for people to say, my back is hurting me because that's a common Mm -hmm. and that's a common pain. So, uh, because you mentioned, you know, bone pain, fractures, but that's when you really got active myeloma and, it, you know, you really need treatment. Hopefully they can yeah. catch that before then. Well, two things, they said, having the bright test because uh, apparently there are dozens of different kinds of tests to, to do uh, to 
the, the blood tests, and then how to interpret those tests. And then, you know, the genetics, that's the fish test. Uh, when, they, when, they, when they take that bone, a little bit of bone marrow, and, and they also take a little bit of that liquid, there's a whole array of tests that needs to be done. And it has to be done, it should be done properly, especially before any treatment, so you know what you have, you know what you're fighting. That reminded me, I saw a movie, a documentary. It was very disturbing. It was about Elizabeth Holmes. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I haven't seen it, but I've, I've kind well, of read a little bit about there's, it. There's, yeah. there's a book called Bad Blood. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Interesting name. Elizabeth Holmes is a dropout from Stanford who had charisma pouring through her yeah. eyeballs. She could convince especially an older, distinguished gentleman, that she had the better idea of how to take blood from, from her fingers and, and somehow through, a, through this Edison box, she called it the Edison box, and come up with these amazing array of stuff. And my little research of what they do with blood, I'm going, well, wait a minute, I don't see how a few drops of blood could possibly a, a tell you all oh, this array, just in myeloma, never mind these other diseases. So when you heard about this story and you heard what you was trying to do, what was your take on the feasibility of that happening? Yeah, so you're right. It's, it's really interesting. The myeloma community have been working, I guess, for maybe 10 or 15 years now to try and get rid of the bone marrow, okay, as in we would love to not put patients through having a bone marrow, just as I think patients would love not to have a bone marrow. And so they've been working on trying to get the same information from a blood test as you would from a bone marrow. And with the newer technology, we're nearly there, but not quite. We can't just get the sensitivity and the, I was going to say, I'm not quite sure what the right word is, but we just can't quite get there. Um, and so we still need to do the bone marrow. And so, as you say, when, when they were talking about this, you're like, nah, can't possibly happen. I think potentially in 10 or 15 years time, as the technology continues to explode. But at the moment, unfortunately, we're kind of still left with, you know, kind of being able to do some things like that. But the majority of times we're not. You've got to take blood from the vein. Yeah, we've got to have blood from the vein. Time. Blood cancers, we've got to have it from the vein. And she had no medical training. Yeah. And it was interesting. Uh, they, they talked about Thomas Edison in this documentary. And he was quite a character. I didn't realize it. I mean, obviously a genius. And, uh, and when his last invention, the, the filament, and he didn't quite get it right, you know, and he, he put people off. Oh, you know, when are you going to have this thing, this, this filament? And they used a term that was very interesting. Fake it till you make it. But this is what Elizabeth Holmes, apparently strategy. Runners, they want, to do, they want to do well in their running. And so they're very concerned about their diet. And they're very interested about vitamins. You mentioned, you call them vitamins. We call them vitamins, we call them vitamins. <laughs> and so in terms of myeloma, especially when you get that first wake-up call, oh, you have MGUS, you know, go to watch, watch it. But some people say, well, what can I do? So in terms of myeloma, is there, is there uh, things people can tweak their diet? I say tweak their diet because, as you know, if, if you go down a diet, you're going to fail. 90% of diets fail. That's why it's a billion dollar, multi-billion dollar industry because people are constantly falling out. So runners are smart. And they say, well, I, I want to be able to run long. I, I don't want to be as tired. I want to you know, get to the starting line fresh and in vigor. I, I, they know about electrolytes and they know about carbon loading. And they know, eat plenty of vegetables, eat colorful, you know, all the colors. Yeah. So in terms of you've got MGUS, you've got smoldering, or even if you've got the dreaded disease and you want to tweak your diet. So what are Thank some you. of the uh, recommendations? Okay. So I would say the first thing, don't stop running. Okay. That would be the first thing I would say. Because the reality for me about 
running is it has obviously a number of health benefits. Number one is physically. And with myeloma, we're thinking about bone strength. And um, particularly if you're in those pre-phases, if you think about it, the bones are then supported by the muscles. And if you can keep those muscles strong, then you're also keeping the bones strong. OK, and so um, having strong bones, having strong muscles, fantastic. So that's number one. So don't don't stop running unless your doctor tells you Okay, that's a different matter. OK, and then also as well, as well as the health benefits of running, we're talking about being outside, moving. We've got the psychological benefits. When we come to diet, I think the the tweaks, I think, really go around that bone health thing again making sure that we're in a good range for our calcium and our vitamin D, okay? Obviously, the, um, the doctors are going to be checking those, okay? But just making sure that we're, we've, got, we've got good bone health. We also need to be a little bit careful of our kidneys, okay? And so we need to be doing kidney-friendly things. So, um, so, for instance, we need to have some calcium, but not too much calcium. We need to have some vitamin C, but not too much vitamin C. And so I actually believe that generally what runners do is actually a good diet that I would actually hope that many people would actually adopt. I'm not entirely sure I would ask them to change very much apart from just to continue doing that. Because one of the things we sometimes find if people are too healthy, they maybe actually cause more damage, okay? Because there's some discussion about um, high doses of vitamin C not being so good, or a lot of green tea, for instance, not being so good. Whereas we know a kind of reasonable amount of vitamin C, reasonable amounts of green tea are actually beneficial. So there's a little bit of a balance there. Some of the things that people do find helpful, I'm not sure there's any science behind it, but um, there's certainly lots of, of discussion about kind of many of the um, herbs and spices that our Oriental colleagues would use. So turmeric is one of the, or curcumin is one of the very common ones, which is supposed to have some um, good effects. And then um, sirtuins, they're actually in red wine. So they're potentially um, red wine and dark chocolate, which clearly I, I would be a great fan of. Um, so they're meant to be quite helpful as well. Oh, um, good, good. Well, liquor's getting a bad rap. <laughs> now they say beer's bad. But uh, occasional red wine is yeah. just good. Uh, I, I like, I've turned to green tea, matcha. Matcha, I think it's called. Yes, no, yeah, that's right. And yeah. uh, we have that every, I have that every evening with perfect. a piece of dark chocolate. Perfect. Absolutely perfect. Uh, so, but I've been tweaking my diet for, for many years. I've been running not that long. I mean, I, I, I've done 18 marathons, so I have to prepare for all of those things. And then and you, and you tweak things, you know, you learn things. As runners, we run for causes. So we, we know a lot about diseases because we support the Leukemia Society. We support the Kidney Society. And we learn, oh, we learn about the kidneys. And, the, and one of the important thing is about the kidneys is, you know, watch your salt. You know, be careful with salt. Uh, so processed foods is, you know, is careful, you know, don't eat so many hot dogs. Um, and, uh, and, and, and your blood pressure, you know, you have to monitor that, your blood pressure. Your blood pressure definitely affects your kidneys. So there's a whole array of things that runners already do that naturally follows into the yeah. chronic disease arena. In fact, I had a, I, I've interviewed Many, many world-class athletes that one, one was a, a diabetic. Stephen England, he's, a, he's an ultra-marathoner. Oh, wow. It's yes, a he's done Western well. States. Wow. And he's diabetic. And in fact, he's on team, team diabetic. You know, he's a, he's a spokesperson of all these diabetic runners. Tell me about the diet. In the diet, so you're looking at the cardboard box of the cereal, like the nutrition facts, and seeing how many sugars are in there, and you're staying away from the frosties and those kind of things. 
Um, so it's, but it's really generally just having a healthy diet. It's not, it's not that hard to figure out. Okay. It's keep the salt down and keep the sugar down and, and choose healthy options. Well, there isn't really anything magical about the, the, the diet. Although you mentioned vitamin D, uh, you should, because it's a sunshine vitamin, if you live in New York, you may not be getting yeah. enough of it. You should have the vitamin D in. And some people take turmeric uh, or they use it for cooking because turmeric is hard to absorb. So you have to be very yeah. careful. Yeah. You know, you should you, you use a fermented version of it or something yeah. like that. So taking vitamin D, turmeric. Yeah. You, you know, they're not, they're not, they're not going to cure you, but they might make you feel better. Yeah. No, I mean, I think, as you say, as a general idea, runners are, in my kind of experience, are usually in good health. And so when um, when I'm when I'm looking at a patient and deciding if and when they need treatment, as you say, it's generally easier to treat if they have looked after themselves over the years. And that's one of the general important things. So as you say, looking after your blood pressure, looking after diabetes, doing all of those general kind of things that you need to do, like checking your prostate, doing the colonoscopy, all of those other kind of important health things are important to do alongside having a kind of diagnosis of MGUS or myeloma. And it sounds dreadful. It didn't used to matter because, unfortunately, the myeloma would get you. But nowadays, actually, we're getting it so that if you do need myeloma treatment, we can get the disease down and low. And therefore, all of these other things are actually really important because we want people to have a long and, and healthy right, life. Right, right, right. Yeah. So, so some people came up because they got bad, bad feet or they got a knee issue but they can, you know, they do gardening or they can, they can, they can dance. Yeah. Uh, something that gives them a movement, but yeah. it, it should be done on a regular basis. You yes. know, once a year marathon dance, that doesn't count. You got to dance every weekend or you got to do some kind of movie or, or even a simple thing as walking. And, and, you know, you can do the, your own research and, you know, people say, you know, there's this magical 10,000 steps a day. That it turns out that 10,000 is a marketing gimmick. <laughs> but walking 4,000, 8,000, turns out walking in, in multiples of four is good. The minimum is 4,000. Mm -hmm. If you can walk 4,000 steps, you're getting some benefit. Anything less, not really. If you want more benefit, 8,000 is better. Oh, sure, go for 10. <laughs> yeah. And then you're right. The benefit on the kind of muscles and your core and the body strength and then there's that benefit on the heart as well. So there's a kind of, you know, it comes in different kind of ways that the benefit has. And in New York, one of the advantages living in New York, you probably live in a high rise. Take the stairs. I'm not doing it for 26 flights. So. <laughs> one of my patients does. So I have to take, I take my hat off. I'm on seven flights and I think I'm the probably the person to take them the elevator the least. I always go down the stairs and up the stairs. Okay. And I was only seven flights. Let's introduce you to our audience. Tell us, where were you born and what was your childhood like? I was still back in England. Yes, no, well spotted. So I'm from the UK. I grew up in Manchester. And then when I was 11, I moved down to Torquay, which is a, a kind of seaside village down in the south. No other doctors in the family. I actually wanted to be the physiotherapist for Manchester United Football Club. Um, but I wasn't allowed into physical therapy school because I'm not very good at hand-eye um, coordination. So they let me into medical school instead. <laughs> so. uh, as a child, were you very active, uh, athletically speaking? So I, did, um, I didn't do any running. Um, I did um, gymnastics. And um, then as I got a little bit older, I did hockey. So, oh, wow. Yeah. Um, and I didn't actually... Was, I'm not really, I was going to say, not really built as a runner, if that's the right expression. And I didn't really start doing running until I'd become a doctor. And I think what you said earlier, somebody said, oh, let's do a charity run. And that's where it, um, that's where it started. But what interested you about the medical profession and why blood? And why blood? So the main reason for blood was that I spent some time as a, what I call a house officer, a resident, um, and um, I just love the fact that you got to know your patients. So with, with many different disease areas you do, the, the patients are a little bit like on a conveyor belt. You know, they come in, you see them, they go home again, and you never really see them again. 
Whereas I really enjoyed getting to know my patients and hopefully being able to make a difference. And so that was what attracted me to, to blood cancers. It was the best decision I ever made. And I so much enjoy. So within my job at the moment, and I guess all the way through, I've been very fortunate that I see patients for about half the week. And then I work in the laboratory the other half of the week. So I get to combine science and to really think about kind of how myeloma happens or why myeloma happens or how we might treat it. And then I get to do the patient part as well. Oh, so I'm, right. I feel really, you know, I, yeah. I adore my job, if that's, that's the right yeah, expression. We're, we're so happy to have you here. But what brought you from the UK to, to America? The so my husband and I got recruited over here to help run a, a myeloma center. So um, we were we were in the UK. We were at an um, uh, incredibly good hospital in the UK. And the offer came to say, you know, would we like to move? And we're always up for an adventure, being a kind of um, physical one, like running marathons. So we went to Arkansas first. There's oh, a huge myeloma oh, practice in Arkansas, uh, a very famous myeloma practice there. And then we got recruited up to New York after that. Oh, yeah. Excellent. Oh, it was yeah. Arkansas. I think yeah. I read a little bit that uh, the donors there wanted you so much to come to build a practice that they raised a lot of money. That's right. To no, encourage you to come. Yeah, we were very fortunate that in NYU, it's an amazing um, hospital and an amazing cancer center. And they really wanted to boister up the blood cancer side of things. And so, as you say, we were very fortunate to, to be fact, recruited here. They recently gave you another job. Right. You were just, I saw in mid January, you're now the, I like the, how they phrased it, the inaugural director for something called the, the Center for Blood Cancers. That's right. So the idea is that, um, that I guess, just as, as with anything, that we can all benefit from working together. Okay. And so the idea is to bring the, not only the doctors, but the scientists together and get them working more, more closely so that we can bring some of the amazing ideas that are going on in the lab through into the clinic as quickly as possible. And now because of Zoom technology, you don't now have to fly off to a conference and to, to meet. Now you can have whatever you need weekly, bi-weekly on Zoom and, and get a lot of that, uh, that knowledge. Yes. As I say, that's one of the amazing things about being in myeloma is that the doctors know each other so well that we do get to share that knowledge and really kind of make a lot of progress. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now... So you're recruiting. Well, this is New York. You know, it's probably a little easier to recruit people. To, if you need people to come to the to the uh, to NYU and NYU Lagoon, I think they were in the news a few years ago. Uh, all the medical students go there for free. Yeah. So tuition's taken care of, and um, one of the amazing things, uh, as you say, about New York City, is that you get to interact with people that you maybe on first glance, don't think would be useful for research. So, for instance, we're currently working with some bioengineering people who the idea being that maybe they can help us recreate an artificial bone marrow. And if we could recreate an artificial bone marrow using their, their plastics and their technologies, then we'd be able to test our drugs in that environment. That, so there's all sorts of kind of that's amazing so things. reminds me of the that uh, Westworld. I already saw the first season, but only because of Anthony, uh, Anthony Hopkins. <laughs> Tony Hopkins. Anthony Hopkins, yeah. Anthony, yeah. Anthony, right. And they had these 3D printers, and apparently you could print anything. I said, oh my goodness, yeah. uh, including a full-grown horse. <laughs> yeah. So I imagine the 3D bone marrows will be on the way. What else is exciting in the field? I heard recently there's a vaccine that's being tested. Yeah. So a lot of the work that's being done now is really trying to say, OK, how can we use the patient's immune system to fight the cancer? Um, and so there's a number of different ways of doing that. So we have um, a number of studies looking at vaccines. Maybe we could vaccinate and get the patient's immune system to work better. There's also these studies using different antibodies and then actually last week, the FDA approved a, a, new a new kind of drug called a CAR T-cell drug, where we take a patient's own T-cells 
and engineer them to actually kill off the myeloma cells. So there's a lots of kind of space age techie stuff going on, but using the patient's own immune okay. system. In your opinion, will there be a cure where people can either take pills or vaccines in the next five years, 10 years? I would have to say 10 years or maybe 15 years. If you'd asked me 20 years ago, I'd say no way. But the rate of change is just incredible. So, so interestingly, that time frame of 10, 15 years, I want to ask you, you know, which sources you recommend. But I recommend Health Tree, and I think mm -hmm. you do. Health yes. Tree, you're on the, on the internet. They have lectures, very short, and they have quizzes at the end. Reminded me back of my, you know, high school days. Oh, did you quiz. pass? <laughs> if I did, I rewatched it again. But one of the doctors used the term value of options. And what he meant was, if you're within remission or within a group of trial within 10 years or 15 years, the good news is doing near that end of that, there will be other tools, other therapies that will carry you forward. So the idea is never give up because if you're, especially if you're in a stable condition, you know, you're in good shape because things are, are getting better. Unless, of course, we're going to a World War III. I know that, that'll change everything. Yeah. So, so would you agree with the value of options theory? Yeah, no, completely agree. It used to be that we didn't have any treatment choices. Whereas now we have, number one, we have a selection of treatment choices. So we've got many tools in our toolbox and we can now actually say, right, we're not quite there yet, but we can say you should have this treatment or you should have that treatment. But you're completely correct. When we get the disease down and into remission, there's actually all this research going on behind the scenes. And as you say, if the disease stays quiet, then what we might recommend today might be something different in two or three years time. And I, I literally mean that kind of time frame, because if I look back, the treatments we're recommending today are completely different to what we would have recommended three years ago. Wow. And that's why I think something you said earlier is that it's important to have a doctor locally, okay, but it's then important to have a myeloma specialist as well. And most local doctors are very comfortable and happy for you to talk to the myeloma specialist. And dare I say it, most myeloma specialists you know, are very happy for you to be looked after by the local doctor. And it's just getting that commun that three-way communication, yes, which is yes, key. Yes, yes. Back to your running. You, you said you started running. You were in medical school or after medical school. Somebody said, let's run for charity. Do you really call your first run of significance? Yeah. So I think there's two. I was thinking about this. One was a, um, a half marathon um, around Leeds when I lived in Leeds at the time. But the one that jumps out the most is actually um, one where I actually got an email in my inbox that said, um, congratulations, you have a place for the New York Marathon. And I looked at it and I thought, that's very strange. Number one, I've never run a marathon. And number two, why would I have a place? And I actually thought it was junk mail. And I went upstairs to talk to my um, friend. Um, who has now actually become my husband, but at the time was my Dr. friend, Morgan. Dr. Morgan. My and doctor. I, your doctor. And I said to him, I said, Gareth, I've just got this really weird email. What's going on? And he went, hmm, I think I volunteered as for a marathon when I was drunk one night. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so that was how I managed, how I ended up running the New York Marathon was because he, um, but we had, it was a good few years ago now. But we had an amazing time. There was a group of us that, that ran it. We ran it for a myeloma charity. Um, and we, you know, I spent the time training and it completely hooked me and I've um, run ever since. You've done a few uh, midnight runs, yeah, including so, uh, a very this, cold weather this past one, which of course yeah. beautiful warm weather. Yeah, I am not a speed runner. On a good day, a 10 minute mile girl. On a bad day, a 12 minute mile girl. Um, but I could just keep on going and I, I love being outside. And as you say, I'm happy to do, you know, whatever. I just enjoy being outside. Oh, yes, so. yes. As you noted, many runners call running their therapy. And some take exception to that. The way I use it is, okay, if I can run a mile, 
or two miles and feel, and, and, you, and you definitely should feel good about it afterwards. What that means, well, you're not fatigued. So you don't have that symptoms of the some diseases you say, well, you're fatigued and you worry about it. Oh, am I fatigued today because, because I'm getting older? And that turns out to be an excuse. And if you're telling yourself something because I'm getting older, that should be a warning sign. Okay, talk to somebody else, you know, or, get, or test yourself. Go out for a walk. Does not have to be a run? Can you walk for 20 minutes and walk back for 20 minutes? If not, maybe you should check in with your coach. Listen to your body. So any plans? For a future run, do you have any destination? Any you destination? Want, I want to do this with, <laughs> or I want to now hook Dr. Morgan with something else. The next one we've got, I think, is there is a, a group of doctors that are actually getting together for to discuss the science of myeloma. And so we're, we're all going to do a 5K at that one. That's in a few weeks' time. But um, I haven't got any any big plans. This year, I was supposed to be doing a triathlon. But, um, it, well, last year I was doing it, but it got cancelled because yeah, of the yeah. pandemic. So, um, Which one were you going to do? And so it'd be, it would be my first one. It was one down in New Jersey that I was okay, going to do. Okay, awesome. so, Yes, yeah. it's for first-timers. So, yeah, so it was a yeah. first-timers one. Yeah, but, yeah, um, they got one group where the, uh, the person that runs it, she's the last one to come in. So no one, no one else. That's, it's very good. Of course, it was a diva or something like that. Yeah. There's, there's so many. So I, that, that's kind of one I need because um, I'm, a, as I say, slow and steady. But oh, yeah, that's yeah. the way to go. And again, you know, we, we talk about running. The importance of, of movement is, is critical. I think uh, one of the doctors I was, you know, in the video, they said this really underutilized. There's not enough doctors recommend or encourage, mm -hmm. you know, people to, to keep moving or to start moving and, 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 and there's a lot of support groups. New York has lots of walking clubs that you can go and walk in Central Park or walk in Riverside Park or walk locally. They're really, and, and other people will join you. So, so you, 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 you're killing a couple of birds. You're getting the camaraderie and you're getting the exercise. You're getting the fresh air. And that's so good for your emotional state. Yeah, because exactly. especially when it's time to get the test, that's probably the time you, you know, Hook up your walking or whatever. Yeah. All right. Well, doctor, is there any last words that you have? I think I would say it's never a good time to have myeloma. However, I think that we're making so much progress that we're not quite there at that cure word yet, but we're certainly nearly are there. And from my side of things, if you are a runner, please keep running and give us a shout because we definitely, it's so important. Yeah. So my final words are, you mentioned charities. Of course, Myeloma has no lack of charity runs. I'll be doing one in October. The Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation has many runs throughout the country, but they have one in New York City, a 5K. So I want to invite you to join my team. I'm going to call it Gotta Run With Will. Myeloma team, we're going to fundraise and... It's Dr. Somewhere. Morgan and I will definitely be with you. Great. We would love to do it. Now, I've mentioned it on air, Dr. Morgan has to join us, so that's good. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming in. No. Thank you for having me. It's been a delight. Thank you so much.